Hi, and welcome to EPI's Launcher Classroom. I'm Christina, a former elementary school teacher. And I'm Kyle, a former high school social studies teacher. So today we're going to be talking about how to provide clear expectations using procedures and transitions. We're going to be talking about how to communicate effectively and also what to do when your students are finished working. Kyle, can you start us off by talking about expectations? Sure, if you will. Um... Join me in a little exercise, okay? I want you to pay attention, all right? I want you to pay very close attention. Are you paying attention to me? Are you sure? Let's see. All right, is your desk cleared off of all materials? Uh, is your cell phone turned off and put away? Uh, are all the tabs on your computer, except for this one, closed out? Is there any music or is there a TV maybe playing in the background? All right, so I'm sure that none of you probably met this criteria, right? Um, and you may have thought that you were paying attention to me, right? Uh, but you didn't meet my standards for paying attention, right? And so that's why as a teacher, you have to clearly define these expectations yeah. to your students. How can they be expected to follow them if they don't know what they are, mm -hmm. right? So procedures are absolutely necessary uh, to the classroom. Yeah. They kind of establish the order, the general flow of how things go, mm -hmm. um, lead to that organization that you want in your classroom. They also cut down on time for misbehavior. Absolutely. Um, and they can get you back a lot of instructional time in the end. Yeah. So how, how do we teach these procedures to our students? So there's essentially a process for doing that. And as you can see, there are a few different steps that you need to take in order for this to be really effective. Right. So the first thing that you'll need to do is explain the procedure or transition that you're trying to have your students do. You're wanting to make sure that you, you go step by step and make sure that it is very clear that the students are not having any misunderstandings, uh, that you are you know, including every part of the procedure or transition and allowing students to ask questions while that process is taking place. You know, um, So essentially you're wanting to verbalize those but also make sure to write them down. So you're wanting to verbalize those steps, say it out loud to your students, talk about it, and then make sure that they can also read it and go back and refer to it when they need to. After that, you'll want to demonstrate the procedure or transition. If you are moving throughout the room, if there's a transition, you know, a procedure to get a certain material item from around the classroom, model that for your students. Actually walk over and do it in front of them and make sure and do it more than one time, especially if you're going, um, you know, different areas in the room, if you're uh, using any kind of materials that could be considered heavy or considered having a lot of parts or something that they would really need to know. Um, as uh, like the last time when you refer to the, your, your Chromebooks mm -hmm. and putting those away, that procedure was set up very clearly and you used a visual and made sure that they understood that uh, in a previous session. So make sure that once you have modeled those, that you're then rehearsing them with your students. Once you show them, you you say, okay, now's the time. We're gonna try it together. If it's If it's transitioning from one place to the other, do that together with them. Though it might take a few minutes of extra time in the beginning, those transitions being set clearly and effectively and every student understanding them will save you so much time in the long run. Yeah, good. So one procedure that we find that is absolute necessary is an extension activity. Absolutely. When students finish their work early, what are they gonna do? Um, this is a time in the classroom where we see you know, misbehavior start taking mm -hmm. place. A student that finish early is going to start to get bored. They're gonna try to figure out how to occupy that time. And that may be seen by pulling out their cell phone. Mm -hmm. It might be seen to talking to yeah. a, a neighbor or making a sound, um, laying their head down to go yes. to sleep. Any a number of misbehaviors can occur when a student doesn't have anything to do. So you need to make a procedure for an anchor activity. So. It's important to note here that an anchor activity is not just piling on more work. Absolutely. It's not just giving them more of the same of something that they've already done, mm -hmm. um, but giving an extension, a little bit of a deeper dive on yeah. the material that, that you have covered yeah. already. It has to be meaningful. Yeah, it needs to uh, you know, help them with the unit. Absolutely. It needs to be on topic. It's not just you know, busy work. Um, so this is gonna enhance their learning. It's gonna cut down yeah. on misbehavior. 
Um, but but once again, it has to be meaningful. Do you have any exactly. examples of uh, anchor activities that you used? Yeah, so when I was in elementary school, uh, one of my favorite anchor activities to use that seemed to work very well uh, was an interest activity. They were allowed to choose a book and be a part of a book club. So we had a certain sets of books and um, I ended up creating these sets and then some were already in the room. So I used what I had. Um, or I went to, uh, you know, places with highly discounted books and got books that uh, didn't cost me hardly anything uh, and also donations. So using book sets and you'll, you will take a, uh, you know, certain, you could take a piece of paper or maybe a card and on that card in that book set, certain pages go along with questions. So while the students are reading, they choose a book from their book club, they write down which book they had, and they have a part of their journal that's their book club journal. And then once that, once they, you know, have gotten to a certain part in the book, the book club students from around the room will meet together and it will allow them uh, to speak about that book and share those interests and share what they're thinking. So not only does it build that comprehension for reading and give them an interest, it's also something that they can immediately do from where they are in the room. They don't have to move around a whole lot um, or disrupt anyone, and then they can also do that independently. It is independent work. Uh, another one is uh, math tutor. So I had my students, I said that I had a nephew, you can, you know, use uh, something like that. And I don't have a nephew, but I did say I had a nephew at the time and would, uh, that he was slightly behind them in, in class and he needed some help with tutoring. And I didn't have time to make really cool questions, start word math problems for him. So if I uh, could get their help, that would be great. And they just found that really cool. So I would give them, I would have a certain part of my board, you know, that had, uh, you know, help Riley. And, and it would have the certain type of math that he needed to, to have help with. So of course I would change that as our uh, class went on and changed. So that was a two, you know, minimally uh, timed. It didn't take a whole lot of time for me to plan those and it really was effective in my class. Wow, that's awesome, you know, that you had those built in for them to easily transition over yes. to doing those activities. Exactly, so, independently. Great examples. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So in my class um, for history, I basically told my kids that they were historical researchers. And so once they had finished their work, uh, I gave them a sheet of paper with people from the time that we were yeah. studying, with uh, major historical events during the time we were studying, or like belief systems, you know, it could be uh, religion or mythology oh, yeah. or economic theory, you know, any of cool. these. But they were allowed to select uh, from this sheet, you know, which topic that they wanted to be the historical mm -hmm. researcher for. Right. Um, and so there was a, a little bit of a writing component to this. There's a little bit of a visual component, which later, you know, I could put their work up on my walls again. Yeah. Um, but it was an easy transition for them because once they were done, uh, they just pulled their Chromebook out or maybe they already had it out mm -hmm. because of the other assignment and then pulled up their Google Doc and just continued to work on um, their historical project, mm -hmm. basically. But they, you know, had choice in it. Um, it was part of their interest. They learned more about the time period, which, you know, has always connections to all the Absolutely. other events and happenings yeah. at the time. Um, so they were able to enhance their learning about the, the time that we were studying. So, um, you know, think about these types of things. You know, uh, is it easy to get to? Is it easy to transition to? Will it be distracting? Exactly. Because that's why you want, that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why you want the yes. anchor activity in the first place, to cut down on those distractions. Yes. So, you know, consider these things in yeah. your planning. Consider them uh, something that can be long-term, not an anchor activity that they can finish in five minutes right. and then you're just having the same issue. Um, so we see some of your questions yeah. coming in now and we're looking forward to, to getting into those. So we're going to check those out now. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you. Hello again everyone, thanks for watching and for these great questions. 
We will answer as many as we can today, and any questions we don't have time for, we'll have an EPI support team member contact you directly for an answer. All right, let's take a look at our first question. This comes from Salman. I don't know how to do the emergency procedures at my school. Where can I go to learn more about what I'm supposed to do? All right, thank you for this question. Emergency procedures at your school are very important, and so I'm glad you're asking about those. Uh, I suggest to go to the office at your school and see um, where those are. They're often, um, you know, procedures for fires, procedures for inclement weather, and as well as, um, you know, if there was ever I anyone in the school that wasn't supposed to be there, like a lockdown. Um, so make sure that you know those and are up to date on those. Schools will often have required times that they will go over and practice those procedures as a school. So make sure that you know when those are going to be and, um, and if they come to your room and, and you know, say something's going on to, that you know uh, and that your students know as well how to practice those procedures. All right, next question. Alonso asks, as soon as I start taking attendance, my students become bored and start misbehaving. But attendance is a requirement. Is there a better procedure I can use? Hey, Alonzo. Thank you for the question. So <coughs> what I'm gathering here is that you're doing attendance taking in the traditional way where you'll call out a student's name and they'll say if they're, they're present or not and then you mark them. Obviously, this is kind of bad for two things. One, it's going to take up your instructional time. Um, and two, like you said, students are going to become bored, they're going to start misbehaving, they're thinking, oh, it's just another roll call, that type of thing. So you may not, however, need an actual procedure for this. If you have a printed out uh, seating chart with their names on it that you're not completely familiar with, what you can do is take a quick glance at your room, um, see which seats are empty, especially when you've got them already working on something, and then you can mark those students as absent. Um, but if you have a very difficult time learning their names for some reason or you know you've just changed up your seating chart or something like that what you can do is you can have each student's name printed off and laminated and then have that alongside a basket somewhere placed in your room and as the students enter the room they can take their own name and place it in the basket if they are there. Um, remind them that they're not to place their friend's name in it or something like that and then when you have time you can go collect the basket and pull all the names out of it and mark those students as present. So thank you very much for that question. The next question is from Alvita. Should there be differentiation in my anchor activities? All right, Alvita. So with anchor activities, keep in mind that they should be able to be independent and the student should be able to do them um, without help from, from you or from their peers. So if you need uh, anchor activities that are differentiated, that is completely fine in your classroom. Just make sure that your students know what anchor activities they are supposed to be doing at that time. All right, our next co question comes from Mariana. My class is pretty orderly until something out of the ordinary happens, like a student coming in late or a visitor to the class. How can I keep the students on task in these situations? Thank you, Mariana. So you want to make it not a distraction, right? So yes, developing a procedure here will definitely work. So when you have your students, talk to them about what you want them to do when they're coming to the class tardy. A lot of times they'll have like a minute slip or a tardy slip or something when they're coming in the class. So what will happen is they'll come in and they'll start waving it at you or want to hand it to you. This is a huge distraction, right? So create a basket, create a space where they can lay their tardy slip, tell them that you want them to enter as quietly as possible, uh, to take their belongings back with them to their desk so they're not moving around the room, and then when you find a, a regular break, then you can go up to the student and they can put their belongings away if that's something that you do in your class. But let them know that them being tardy isn't to be a distraction and it's something that you'll handle later on when you have time. Uh, as far as visitors are concerned, uh, make sure that your students know 
if you have a planned visitor coming by, uh, let them know who they're going to be, what they're there for, when they come in, you know, talk about a greeting and addressing them. Mm -hmm. Of course, there may be some unannounced visitors, like getting an observation or something of that nature. But once again, kind of discuss in advance what the procedures are for a visitor. You know, say that you will address them first and then the class can tell them good morning, however you want to handle it. But make sure that you have something in place there. Thank you. Next question coming in is from Carl. How do I know what we need procedures for and what we don't? Can there be too many? All right, Carl, thank you for your question. So my first response and reaction to the, your question is that we need procedures for everything, right? Um, and as a teacher and when I was in the classroom, we did have procedures um, for just about everything, but those procedures, once taught, will then often comes naturally to those students. So uh, with too many procedures, there cannot necessarily be too many procedures as long as your procedures are clear and that there are not multiple procedures for one thing. So your students are, uh, you know, confused about something or, or um, lost on what to do. There needs to be clear cut procedures for each thing. So in thinking of what you need a procedure for, you have to make sure that if your students are confused about something, if there is ever um, any kind of you know, loudness in your room or where you feel like it is, you're not in control or that the environment is not conducive to learning, you need a procedure. If, for instance, you have you know, your students in the hallway or you have in your class, um, like when we were speaking on those <coughs> on those different things that, that we were talking about as far as your materials and all of those things. Uh, you want to make sure that everything is very clear in your class. And so if, for instance, you have something that's confusing or you have something that's frustrating you at the end of the day, take a look at that and analyze it and see, can I have a procedure for this? Is there a better way for my students to be able to get what they need? All right, thank you. Next question comes from Lola. How do I get homework participation up in my class? They do not turn in their homework on time. All right, Lola, thank you. So you want to provide them with a way to track that homework that they're turning in and then provide consequences if they aren't turning it in. So something that I did is I had a folder uh, for every single student. It all had their name on it. They were all in a centralized location. And what happened is if they were missing an assignment, I put a copy of that very same assignment in that folder under their name. Uh, when that assignment that they were missing or haven't turned in got to the number three is what I used, then they knew at that time I was going to contact their parents and let them know that they were missing that level of work. So what you're doing is you're always allowing the student to know uh, what they haven't turned in and they, you know, once again know that there will be a consequence to that, that you're going to follow up with their parents and let them know what work they're missing. Um, this is too so there's not a surprise when you start getting like report cards rolling out or something like that. You don't have a parent who comes in and says, you know, why did they get an F? Why didn't you tell me they were missing all this work? You know, mm -hmm. this helps make you responsible too for notifying the parents and keeping them up to date. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Jana. There's already so much content to teach. How do I find the time to go over all of these procedures? All right, Jana. So when thinking of that time, you want to go back to when we were talking about, you know, how much time you have all in all. And knowing that you will have so much more time if these procedures are clear and if you have them to where they are solid and you, you know, they're repetitive and they're, they come natural to the students. And so even, even small amounts, um, as it says in the text, you know, you take three or you know, two or three extra minutes per transition and those little tiny amounts add up to mega amounts, um, you know, towards the end of the month and towards the end of the year. So taking time now will give you time later. All right, thank you. Roger asks, when getting out materials, students rush to get them first. What procedures can I use to help that? Telling them to stop isn't working. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, something I would suggest in this case would be to create a jobs or duties board. 
and then change out the students that you assign to specific duties each week. So, you know, get two, three students, however many you need for your materials that you think is necessary, and it'll be those students' jobs that week to collect and hand out materials. Um, it'll make it a lot more organized, a lot less chaotic in your class. Thank you. All right, we have one from Hugo. My students are okay in my classroom, but they always talk and misbehave in the hallway. Do you have suggestions for this? Okay, when thinking about your hallway, um, I would make sure that you have first, uh, like we were stating, a procedure for how they behave in the hallway. When I was a teacher, I would um, model what w walking in the hallway and acting, you know, behaving in the hallway looked like. And I had a volume control from zero to four. And at the volume in the hallway was at zero unless a teacher or another adult was speaking to them directly. I would also model, um, you know, how to walk uh, on the right side of the hallway, the correct side of the hallway, and how to uh, make sure to, you know, keep their arms down. If you have and still have trouble when they talk and misbehave in the hallway, I suggest to have a, a, you know, a consequence in place or a procedure where they remove themselves from the line or they have to go back and try that again if it's the whole class. Okay, thank you, Hugo. Dimitri asks, when do I know if it is time to post a visual for my procedures? All right, Dimitri, ask yourself these questions. Um, have I taught the procedure? Have I retaught the procedure? Have I given the students time to practice the procedure? And if you've been doing these things for you know a couple weeks and the students still aren't catching on, then it's time for you to post a visual. Um, so shortly put, if you are teaching something over and over again and they don't seem to be getting it, give them that visual element. It'll give them something more to latch on to. It'll something, give them something to look at in your classroom when there may be some downtime or when their minds wander or something of that nature. Um, and it will stick with them better. So yeah, when you see a procedure isn't working, it isn't catching on well enough, post a visual. Thank you. All right, Savio. Which, sorry, which anchor activities will you suggest for the kindergarten level? All right, so thank you for your question. With kindergartners, especially towards the beginning of the year, you're still trying to figure out, you know, what reading level that they have, how long they have been, um, you know, reading and, and things at home and where they are. You will have, uh, you know, a, a difference of levels in your class, so you have to make sure that your anchor activities can reach every one of them. Um, so for kindergartners, uh, I would suggest to do things that involve, um, you know, their letter and small word learning. And then I would also suggest to have, you know, individual folders for your students or for, for certain anchor activities or certain games that you're able to have, such as counting games. You can have um, different small uh, materials like manipulatives out to where they can count them and add them together and do um, you know small e equations and start building that knowledge as well as um, you know of course the silent reading and your and your um, reading time and making sure that they are you know developing that love of of literature as well all right Edward asks, if some students start to break long pencils down into small pieces, then they start to use the small pieces of pencil uh, and uh, to throw each other, like to, to write and, oh, and th to throw at each other. What may I do? All right, Edward. So with this one, okay, one, do you control the materials? Uh, if you do control the materials, then maybe you want to start providing uh, very short, small pencils like you might see at a putt-putt course or something like that. Uh, so it basically makes it impossible for them to break those pencils down. Um, you may also want to revisit your rules. One of the classics of the American classroom, especially for younger kids, is keep hands, feet, and objects to yourself. The pencil would fall under being an object in this case. Um, so maybe this one isn't as much about procedures but more about creating rules and having some preventative measures in place there. Thank you. My wrong says, what do you do about a student who is not even scared about you calling their parent? 
All right, my wrong. So um, first, I, when I was a fourth grade teacher, I would have students that that would tell me um, that it, they didn't, you know, it didn't didn't matter. But oftentimes, it still did. So I would always recommend to continue that level of partnership with the parent. And we don't want to, um, you know, give a level of fear into the into the student because they do that you know they knew, need to see that as a positive partnership that everyone is working um, you know for them and with them and to help support their own you know personal education so we want to make sure to to not use the parents necessarily as a scare tactic but just to make sure that they are informed and that they are you know the partner in in your classroom so as far as them being scared um, make sure to continue even if a student would say that be sure to reach out to that parent regardless of that um, sometimes the student is just posturing about that because they do not want you to call in fact all right thank you for your question all right everyone that's all the questions we have time for today if we didn't get to your question live on the air we will have an epi support team member reach out to you as soon as possible Please join us back here next week, September the 14th at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern for the next episode of Launch Your Classroom. We will be discussing how to respond to chronic misbehavior in your classrooms, as well as how to deal with defiant students. To get the most out of next week's episode, EPI program members should read Chapter 6 in their Launch Your Classroom handbook. Also, we are so excited to announce that Volume 1 of your Launch Your Classroom handbook is now available as an ebook. For today only, use the link in the YouTube description of this video to download your copy for free. Remember to stay up to date on all of the professional development opportunities the EPI offers, and please uh, subscribe to your YouTube channel and click the bell icon to receive notifications when we are live. See you next time.